I Wanna Jump Like Dee Dee with me, Jar Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. Okay, so today we're over to California and um, to meet an extraordinary Chicano woman um, who emerged onto the 1990s um, West Coast punk rock scene in the, in the hardcore punk band Spitboy. Um, and she's, she's uh, now an author and an educator um, who, to my mind, really kind of like embodies uh, punk rock. Um, her memoir, um, which is called The Spitboy Rule, Tales of a Jicana in a Female Punk Band, um, is really is quite an extraordinary read about um, about a time and experiences in, in Spitboy. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tale of identity, self discovery, color blindness, misogyny, privilege, um, and those sort of uh, what really interested me uh, is the sort of the internal external tensions that those those sort of things could uh, uh, create and. Um, it, I found it really written with uh, with a lot of empathy for everyone who's sort of faced those kind of identity and discrimination. So it's my real pleasure to welcome Michelle Cruz Gonzalez. Michelle, thanks very much, and welcome onto the onto the show. Thanks, and thanks for inviting me. It's so um, exciting to somehow transporting myself to Spain. <laughs> one Absolutely, way I tell you, this is this is like the closest that we can get to sort of transatlantic travel, isn't it? You know, these right. kind You're of virtual good. podcasts are brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> great technology well, indeed um so i i know that um that you've been uh, one of you one of your um sort of early influences uh, uh, from the sort of the punk rock side was was the clash and joe strummer and if i could just sort of read you a, a a quote that i found i was thinking okay what can i what can i sort of use and um joe said one of his quotes was punk rock isn't something you grow out of punk rock is an attitude and the essence of that attitude is give us some truth. And, I, and when it, it was when I read that and I thought that really sort of embodies, you know, uh, you and sort of how you've, how you sort of lived your life. Um, um, I'm, I'm interested, like, you know, you know, your sort of formative influences that, that, that kind of led to your, um, you, you know, through your identity to your, to, you know, to your, to your mindset, you know, sort of individuals, events, you know, this, obviously you hung out on the punk rock scene. Um, yeah. Well, um, I think there are a few really core um, particulars. Um, and one is that I grew up in a really small town, but I was mm. from LA. So I had, in addition to having, um, being Mexican American, having that dual identity, I had a sense of myself that um, I didn't really belong in a small town and that I was a more of an urban person. And I did live, you know, I was just eight months old when I left, but I always, whenever we went to visit, I always just felt a real affinity for Los Angeles. And, you know, it is the, it is the second largest Mexican city in the entire world, second to Mexico. And so it, it kind of embodied all these things that I didn't have in the small town where I grew up. And uh, my mom was single. Mm. 80s I actually got into punk in the 80s <laughs> mm. I started my first band in the 80s which is crazy um to think about now but um my mom was single and my two best friends had single moms Nicole Lopez and Susie Carney and yeah. we started bitch fight together and I'm writing a series about bitch fight right now for razor cake and the first one came out and the second one I just submitted um it's been really fun mm. but but we really bonded because we we knew that we were marginalized um, in our community um, because, you know, back then, you know, having a single mom, now having a single mom, a lot of people are like, you know, acknowledge that it bring, gives you toughness and mental strength and independence. Yeah. But back then, if you had a single mom, you were like, you know, a bastard child, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we were like these, you know, ratty little bastard children in this you know hick town and you know Susie was was white but Nicole and I were not and um everybody you know had to comment on it or ask about it so 
Um, and then Ronald Reagan was our president. Yeah. And um, the arms race was, you know, major. The cold, mm -hmm. you know, the, the arms race with Russia was um, kind of always hovered over us. Like, I would say that the existential threat that you feel, that we feel now, that young people feel now about climate change, like we knew actually that, largely because of the clash and stuff, we knew uh, that, that the climate was an issue, but at the time, the most pressing kind of existential threat was the arms race. Yeah. So um, all of these things, and then of course the clash, really, really formed, helped form my political beliefs um or gave me political beliefs because you know i grew up in a small town where people it's it's still it's a weird place it's california but it's mm -hmm. very conservative it votes overwhelmingly republican but hardly anyone votes wow. <laughs> there's just really apathetic bunch of people who rarely vote are not that political but when they do vote they vote republican and they you know they voted trump and stuff mm. So um, they probably voted Reagan. Um, so all of my childhood, you know, when I was a toddler, Ronald Reagan was the governor of the state of California. So my, my, the only leader I had most of my childhood um, um, through high school was Ronald Reagan. Mm. Um, and then Jimmy Carter was, I don't know if he was in the middle there after, I can't remember the order right now, but um it was a little rough. And, you know, Ronald Reagan famously demonized um, women of color on welfare and called them welfare queens. And, you know, we always felt like our finances were, were under threat under his, under his government. And um, so all of those things really pushed me. I mean, all of those things pushed me towards punk rock, the bullying, <clears throat> the being marginalized, the hippie, the hippie, wild hippie, single mom, <laughs> no yeah. money. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood um, by the sewer plant. And the nickname for the neighborhood that I grew up in was Shit Acres. <laughs> wow. um, so you couldn't get, you couldn't live in a shittier part of town. Yeah. Where I grew yeah. Up. And that was the only place my mom could afford to, to she actually bought her house um, to, to, she was a rent to own house. Uh, so all of those things were major. And then, you know, so punk rock, by the time I learned about punk rock, it all just clicked into place. It made perfect sense. And it, it put language to the angst I had about how I experienced the world and the ideals and the stereotypes that everyone foisted on me mm. um, that didn't really, that I knew didn't fit. Um, I was more, so many more things um, in my own head um, and in my own mind than what people thought. Mm -hmm. and, and, and was was that, was it, was it, you know, the sort of the, the, the punk ideology and sort of ethos that um, kind of caused the, you to look at, you, you know, your identity and sort of become sort of curious about, you know, kind of who you were growing up? Well, I actually think the thing that made me curious about who I was, and I think this is common for most people of color, is the way other people treat you. They're always asking yeah. you, what are you, you know, what are you? Where, yeah. are you? where are you from? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I grew up in a town with an American Indian reservation, the Miwok mm -hmm. reservation. And when I was little, um, I had really long hair and Mexicans also put their kid, children, put their Mexican parents also put their kids in braids. Yeah. Um, uh, my mom, my mom likes braids because it actually protects you from head lice, <laughs> which is rampant in schools. But also like when you have long hair, yeah. when, long hair is the beauty standard for, for Mexican girls. And when I was growing up, and, you know, when you have long hair, it just gets naughty. So my mom just put it in braids. So everyone assumed I was Miwok. Everyone, you know, all through elementary school, and my mom made me go to Indian club. And I was like, why am I in Indian club? I thought we were Mexican. So sometimes I like literally thought I was an Indian. And sometimes I, my mom was like, no, you're Mexican. I'm like, well, then why did you put us in Indian club? <laughs> so I had a funny relationship um, with my identity for, that, for those reasons. Mm. Um, and then, you know, with the Miwok kids, I wanted to have an affinity with them, even though I knew I wasn't really Miwok. 
Uh, my mom's like all Mexicans are Indians too, which you know, of course, is totally true. I mean, that's how she got us. That's the argument that she made with the school to get us into the club. Yeah, um, yeah. So those those things, and then I think it that was raised again. Those feelings about my identity raised again when I also wrote about this in Razor Cake in fictional form, um, a Joe Strummer short story. I don't know if you've seen it, but. It's it. I I love this story. It's called Tony and Joe. Okay, and, well, I haven't seen it. No. <laughs> well, when I you know the Clash's Combat Rock came out, right? And they yeah. they have the one song that was the first record I heard of theirs, of course. And in 1983, I saw the Clash at the US Festival, and I was like 14. I had yeah. still had feathered hair, and I came home, and I was just like, well, I am like, this is it. I'm cutting my hair for sure. And I had already wanted to cut my hair. My mom wouldn't let me. Um. So, um, oh gosh. Oh, so the, the Clash's um, song, Should I Stay or Should I Go, which is, you know, is, is ostensibly a love song, right? Has all these words in Spanish and it sounds kind of whack, but it also sounds rad. And it's also like such a cool idea. And, um, and you know, I just couldn't help feeling seen mm. by the clash singing in Spanish. Like they cared enough about other cultures, about Latinx people to like sing in Spanish. And then when I started getting more of the records, they had other songs that had Spanish in them. Mm. And like, I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker, mm. um, but I do speak Spanish. And when I was little, I didn't hardly speak any Spanish. Um, but you know, in high school, we'd listen to the clash, you know, my Nicole Lopez and I were both taking Spanish in high school. And um, we would try to figure out the lyrics and we never could figure out what they were saying in Spanish all the way because nobody can. It's Clash <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's Clash Spanish and it doesn't yeah, really, yeah. you know, it's like a weird translations. But for as, as um, some people would say it's, it's appropriation. Some people would say it's cultural appropriation. You know, and even if that is true, the very fact that a band that I loved cared about other people and weren't totally Eurocentric, like this English punk band wasn't Euro totally Eurocentric, really mattered to me. Mm -hmm. And it really made a huge, you know, really it made me proud to be Mexican. You know, I was getting bullied all the time about being Mexican. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be proud of something when you're when you're teased about it at school yeah. all the time. And they call me Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they would say riba riba andale andale when I walked down the down the breezeway yeah. at school. So having the clash thing in Spanish was a huge, huge a deal for yeah, us. Yeah. yeah. It really made us feel happy. And mm. it made us it made us want to learn Spanish more too. It made us want to study harder. <laughs> Mm, interesting. I think. I, I mean. I think. I, I. I mean. I guess the reason I'm sort of interested in in, in identity is, um, if you, you know, thinking about it from a. Uh, I mean, t take me for example. You know, I I spent a lot of my kind of working life working in 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 a sort of in corporate in the corporate world, mm -hmm. and ended up just disliking it a lot. Um, and and I, and and it's funny with you know sort of with with hindsight, um, you know, thinking about my my kind of childhood, you know, and, and I, you know, I'm a sort of white male, you know, I had, you know, very sort of privileged childhood and, and sort of upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, there were there were things that I kind of went into that I perhaps I, I didn't I didn't know at the time, but I didn't want to do them. They, they weren't really my kind of calling. It was only sort of later when I start looking back and after I'd gone through this and thinking, well, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, you get out and then and, and start doing things that really sort of interest me and, and almost like you feel that, that you're calling it. And, and I felt that I had to kind of go through some finding my own, ver you know, version of my identity, almost like this sort of, you know, the sort of Buddhist philosophy of ever-changing, um, you know, your ever-changing self. You know to find out sort of who you are and then kind of start doing things and be true to yourself but to do and, and to do that takes you know you, you have to get rid of your fear yeah you know, also to be able to to kind of do that and i remember what one part in in your in your memoir as well when you um uh when you visited your grandma in in los angeles mm -hmm. um which really kind of struck home with me 
everybody to comment on that. Do story. they? Yeah, yeah. It's a striking moment in the book. It really is. Yeah, it it was a, it, you know, I knew I was going to write that piece, mm. but um, I didn't, you know, when I wrote, when I made, I made critiques of the band and people in the band, right? And in doing so, I had to make some critiques of myself and yeah. reflect on the ways in which I was hell of annoying. Because, um, <laughs> mm. um, you know, if I just pick on everyone else, that's not good writing. But um, I didn't want to make a critique of the band that would spoil the band for anybody. That was really important to me. Yeah. Um, I didn't think that was I was gonna that was gonna be the case when I started writing it. But as soon as I started writing the book, I just had all these, you know, fond feelings about all that Spitboy achieved and what yeah. it brought to my life and what the people in the band taught me. Um, and how we operated, like all of those things were just, there's so many things about Spitboy, the way we operated that were really unique and really were wonderful. And so I didn't want to ruin that for anybody. Um, but I also needed to make the critique about being the only person of color in the band and about, about the, the class stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and because largely the misunderstandings or the feelings about my ethnic identity. If you read that book closely, I think it's more about class than it was about race. Yeah. Um, and, but you know, when you're 24 and you bring your friends home to your grandma's house and they react like that, you are automatically it's going to be you're automatically going to assume that it's about your your core identity yeah. you know um which is what i did um and i do think that they didn't realize that i was that kind of mexican <laughs> i think it really hit them that day like oh um <laughs> I always thought of the, you know, the, those people were Mexicans. We have one of those Mexicans in our band. Um, I really don't think that that quite hit mm. them in the way it did when they saw me at my grandma's house. Um, what, with my grandmother. What, um, I mean, what, what was, what, were, what happened to you after that? I mean, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, kind of like how, I mean, did, did your mindset change after, after that? Well, I think immediately after I was really shook up. I mean, you know, I write about, you know, being in the band, the van on the way home, just not yeah. even what to say. Mm. But then I really compartmentalized it because um, and that's just what we do. You know, mm. we, you care about people and they don't understand you sometimes. And you're not going to just throw away the whole relationship because somebody doesn't understand you once, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's one thing that Spitboy really understood really well. And that is that in order to be in this band that we love, we have to not pick at the things that annoy each other mm. about the other, the mm. other. Like, that is not healthy. Yeah. And that is not a way to foster relationships. And so mm. I, I forced myself to remind, I reminded myself of that a lot. Um, at the end of Spitboy and then the end of Instant Girl, which was a band that I was in with Karen and Dominique for a year after yeah. Spitboy. And we knew we were only going to be together for a year because Dominique was going to graduate school. Mm. Um, at the end of, things really came to a head at the end, um, at the end of, um, excuse me, instant girl, mm. but they weren't great at the end of Spitboy either as depicted in the, the Japan chapter when we're in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of ugly American weirdness going on that I found really embarrassing. And, um, you know, the, the privilege stuff really showed its face. Mm. And there's a, there's a thing that happens with people of color. Like when you kind of you you okay so you're part of this dominant culture and you um you 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 assimilate right you know you have parts of your culture you acculturate you you have parts of your culture yeah. and you take on parts of the dominant culture and that's fine right 
But then sometimes you just go, you know what? I, I'm just kind of like straddling these lines too much. And I, it's too much. I want to, I, I don't want to, I want to be who I am more. Mm. And so when that choice happens for people of color, a lot of people of color go through an angry phase mm. and you're just pissed. You're pissed yeah. at everybody. You know, you're just like, you know, it's kind of like when you become a feminist, you know, you, everything that's sexist, you're going to say something about it. You know, you're going to, you're going to scream and shout and you're mm. going to be fully in your feminism. It's that, it's that, that's the same thing that happens to a lot of people of color when you decide that you're not going to hide parts of yourself that you felt like you had to hide. Mm. And so I went through that phase, you know, at the end of Spitboy, um, and I didn't, you know, because we didn't really know how to talk about race and class. We knew how to talk about feminism, yeah. but we didn't know how to talk about race and class stuff. And so I had, I had all this bottle of anger, you know, from events like that, what happened with my grandma's house and other things that happened in the band, whether it was from the band or while I, we were on tour, things that I just kind of put away. And I just, I, I couldn't shove it down anymore. Yeah. And so I started kind of lashing out at people and, um, and um, that wasn't healthy either, you know, but the key for me really is, and this was important for me to point out in the book, we were young. <laughs> we were, this is, you know, we were 24, 25 at the most at this mm. point. And um, punk rock is very, you know, forward thinking in a lot of ways. But in the 90s, people were still trying to be colorblind and, you know, yeah. Um, I don't see race, you know, and Absolutely, yeah. you kind of thought that that's how you had to think. Are you and handled, so, yeah. So to bring it up would have been kind of weird. Um, and I also just didn't know how mm. to bring it up. And I didn't know because I didn't quite understand that there was race and class together, that there was the inner intersectionality between those two things yeah. and that it was the class stuff more than anything else that, um, that created the friction. Mm. I guess then, you know, you know, sort of in, intersectionality wasn't really a word, it, you know, people didn't know it was like, it, 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 like you say, it was very compartmentalized, you know, it was, it was either, it was either race or class or, or this, you know, there was, there was no, you know, coming together of, 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 of any of those, those sort of issues. Right, yeah, we didn't really, maybe academics were using that word then, but it wasn't yeah. being used in popular culture at all. Yeah. What about? I mean, of, of, of your of your time in sort of Spit Boy, what what did the what did the the, you know, what were the kind of the like the attributes, what you know, and kind of mindset that that you you gained from that that experience that you sort of took forward to what you then did in uh, you know in the in the years after that and and you know your future life. Well, Spit Boy gave me a lot of self confidence. I mean, I've always been a pretty self confident person, like. Mm. I don't know why, honestly. <laughs> um, I, my mom is, my mom is just kind of like, she just is kind of like, I don't give a fuck lady. Yeah. And so like when you're raised by a woman like that, that gives you kind of like a self-confidence because you don't, you're not as caring as much about what other people think. Mm. And, um, and so that really, that was like a big that was big for me. That was really important. And so I've always pretty been pretty self-confident, but Spitboy gave me self-confidence to do things more that, um, that um, like the DIY stuff, um, <laughs> you know, just saying like, yeah, okay, I'm going to write a book or I'm going to write a zine or I'm going to do this. And um, I don't have to be an expert. I don't have to be an expert on this, you know, on this topic to talk about this or, um, you know, so Spitboy just taught some really practical things, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, we like changed our own tires. We like, we read paper maps on tour. We like, I, we all had a little job, like Adrian cleaned the van on tour. Karen kept, took care of the money and I fixed the door when it broke in the car or the tape deck, you know, um, I was kind of like the handy one somehow. Um, I always had my, my drummers always have a lot of tools. So tools, yeah. I didn't how to deal with drums. <laughs> tools, so I had my tools and I'm like, okay, I'll fix the damn door, you know? Um, so, you know, there was a way in which Spitboy, you know, we had to fulfill a lot of roles as a punk rock band. And, um, and so, 
you know, just kind of gave me a fearlessness not to, you know, to, to just go like, all right, I'll try to do that or whatever, which I already had a little bit anyways. Cause you know, when you grow up um, poor, you, you, you kind of um, learn how to make do, right. You mm-hmm. learn how to make do. And so. Um, I, I, but, I, know, I, I know exactly what you mean about the, about drummers. I mean, I was doing some work with a, with a band a couple of years ago, you know, sort of breaking down the drum kits. I soon quickly realized that I need to have a, like a lot of tools. It's so <laughs> just cute. don't leave home without them <laughs> you gotta have your drummer tools i mean i still like, don't touch my tools you know like you know, i have my little screwdrivers and i still have some of the tools that i had and i don't let anyone i don't let anyone of my family use them yeah but, those are my it, tools. but it's kind of interesting like, like about you, you know there was there was stuff obviously that, that you had to do you know the diy stuff it's like okay well if i don't do this it's not going to get done and then there's the other stuff which is the um the belief in yourself the you know so you you've almost like kind of cancelled out the any any kind of limiting belief in yourself any limit you know limits that you have you're just saying okay well i can i'm, I'm going to write a book why not i'm going to i'm going to do it which i think i think is 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 so in, so important and i think that's like really kind of powerful you know sort of mindset to have yeah i um Collaborating with people, as tricky as it can be, um, helps you because like everybody has their own style, right? Mm. And everyone has their own strengths. And like we learn so much from each other's strengths. Yeah, yeah. Um, which was really, really cool, you know? Um, while I had my role as a door fixer, like that also probably, you know, somehow influenced other people, mm. you know, in other mm. ways. Um, Karen was really good with money. She managed the money. And, you know, that, like, if I were ever in a band, you, I would institute the kind of system that we kind of had in the band where there, you would save all the money that you got from the gigs to buy sticks and guitars, you know, guitar strings and, mm. um, you know, dole it out, you know, carefully and not just like blow it all, you know, the same night you got it on booze or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So we really um, did influence each other um, with our own natural skill set or things that we learned in our own family. So that was really cool. And, you know, Adrian was really, um, I was very standoffish mm. when I was younger because, you know, I think from the bullying and being the only person of color in the band, like I, I was the least trusting. So I was always the cagiest. Yeah. And um, Adrian is very outgoing and she will talk to anybody. And I really learned mm. a lot more about being open um, and, um, and you know, she has this way, I wrote about this in the book. This is one of the things I love the most about Adrian. She has this way of like making, of giggling at herself or making fun of her or noticing something weird or like something that she's done that's yeah. off or quirky she will acknowledge it and then she'll just laugh. And I just, I always was like, I just thought like, wow, that's so cool that she's just so like <laughs> naturally comfortable just being like, ah, eh, she just, you know, shrugs it off and it, you know, without shame. And and I think that yeah. I did grow up with a lot of shame, mm-hmm. um, being poor, being Mexican and um, the way she operated in the world without shame. Like really, I think that was really something that I learned a lot from Adrian. Mm-hmm. Um, just kind of throw that off and, um, you know, she had like strategies to deal with, with those feelings. With, yeah, um, yeah. It came off really great and made her so charismatic and charming and, and sweet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was, what was your, um, how did you approach, you know, writing the book? I mean, you know, in terms of like, okay, I can, I can do this. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Right. Did, did you, did you have to, um, did you have some fears that you needed to, to face? Did you, was it an anxious time? Well, I went to college. I got an MFA. And I yeah. got an MFA in creative writing, English class creative writing. And I studied fiction. I focused on fiction. So I was like, you know, fancy myself this fiction writer. You know, I'm going to come out and write a novel. And it's just going to be <laughs> so, you know, revolutionary. And I come out and I write, I write a memoir about growing up in Tuolumne. And there's a lot of stuff about the first band bitch fight in it. And then um, once I exhausted that topic, I was in, I do this online writing group called Literary Kitchen. 
And yeah. it's like all online. You submit online and the teacher reads your work and you, you know, there's some writing exercises and other people comment and you comment on other people's work. And um, I met a lot of really great friends in that group too. Mm. But um, one of the prompts that Ariel Gore, who is the teacher um, of that program, um, one of the prompts she wrote just made me think about a, one of the Spit Boy stories. Um, and I think it was, um, uh, I think it, it might've been the Riot Girl story. I think it was the Riot Girl story. Yeah, so okay, that. yeah. And then I wrote um, in that same class, I think I wrote another one. And after I had like one or two, I posted one of them on my blog. And, you know, I had been, you know, out of graduate school at this point for, I don't know, at least 10 or 12 years. Mm. Um, 10 years probably. And, um, you know, was hoping to build a, a writing career in addition to being a teacher, right? So I post one of the pieces on my blog and um, people like kind of started commenting on it a bunch. And people started sending me photos. I posted another one and people started sending me photos of Spit, uh, Spit Boy, old zines. Martin Sorondegui from Los Crudos posted um, one of the pieces and I had like a thousand hits in one day. And wow. I was like, holy shit. Like I've been wanting to have like this writer's career, right? And I've been sitting on this audience that I didn't even know yeah. I had. So it was really, really like bizarre. Like, but the Martin said to me, he goes, Todd, cause he still calls me Todd. He's Todd, I always told you that the spit boy thing, that's your thing. Like you had, you can't just turn your back on that. Cause for years I was in graduate school. I had a son and I, and I was just mad at punk. You know, I, I broke up mm. with punk rock for a little while. And, um, you know, in that, the, those Cruzo story, I made yeah. it very clear that I was kind of had it. So that was really my breaking point. And, um, he kept, you know, Martin and I remained friends all those years. And, um, he was like, oh, you know, you're going to write about it one day or you're going to, it's going to come back one day. Don't, you know, you wait and you see, and I was just like, oh yeah, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever. And sure enough, I started, you know, writing these pieces and people really liked them. So I wrote a few more and posted them and I got a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. And um, then I was like, I'm obviously, I think Ariel said, oh, you're, you're writing a book, you know that, right? And I was like, yeah, I think you're right. I'm obviously <laughs> writing a book here, aren't I? And, um, and I, it was like a no duh, you know, like my other book, no one wanted to publish it. I was trying and I was like, this is the book that's going to get published first. I can tell now. Mm -hmm. So, um, I sat down and I just wrote a list of all the things I wanted to write about. And then some of them were short stories that were too short for one piece. So I thought about, I started, then I wrote down themes that I should address. And then I put the themes together, two mm -hmm. stories together that would cover one theme. And then I wrote more pieces and I had about 12 or something, maybe 14. And I queried PM Press or I emailed Ramsey because I know him. And I was like, hey, would you be interested in this? I'll write the book proposal. He's like, I would be. So I wrote the book proposal and um, sent them. And then they wanted to look at all the pieces. And um, that summer, I just started writing them. You know, meanwhile, I had my list. I started writing the pieces. And um, he came back and he was like, um, we have some concerns. And I was like, ooh, concerns. And um, he was like, we don't want this just to be a book about the band. We don't want it to be a book just about touring. Mm. And oh boy, we want more of you. I like literally teared yeah. up. I was like, what? And I, I didn't really get that when I was writing it. And he was like, he saw the because I didn't have a title yet mm. he saw he saw that it the 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 good parts in it that could be developed that yeah. were about being a person of color in the band he saw that in there and and pushed me to flesh that out and I'm so glad he did that was like a gift that was a major gift um and then when I started to sat down, so some of the pieces I added more, like I added the end to the grandma story and mm. then some, and then I wrote it um, like the prologue, um, the prologue, um, I, that was a whole another piece that I wrote later. And so some pieces I added more of myself 
and some people some of the pieces um i just i wrote new pieces based on that yeah. that um, ask mm. um, it, it made it a much more well-rounded book in the end for sure. I, I i completely agree i mean that was the that, that was the that was the, that was the part of it. That was the dimension that that for me really, um, you know, makes it sort of stand stand out. Um, you know, it's, it's it's always it's always great to, you know, hear stories, you know, of of what happened and things like that. You know, people people love that sort of stuff. But to 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 really, you know, then kind of go into some of the issues that you you sort of felt and you faced. Um, you know, you know yourself, and then with with the other the other sort of the band members and the people that you sort of met along the way, mm-hmm. I think it was I mean I think that was a, that was such a great move to to put that in because that that you know I think it, you know it's it um, I think I, you know I think I think it's re- it's for readers it's really kind of helpful because it it, it you know rather than just sort of passively consuming mm-hmm. the book you're thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, and and in whatever way you're sort of taking out of that, you're sort of relating, you know, whatever parts you can to to yourself and to your own life and your own sort of experiences, and it's it's re- very very thought provoking. I think I wanted more of myself in it. Like, I think like I I would have wanted more of myself in it no matter what. Mm. But I think I the reason why I didn't do that originally was because. It's a weird thing to be one person representing a band, right? So yeah. but in my mind, I'm, you know, I couldn't quite, I don't think I articulated even this clearly in my head, but I think the feelings I had was, is this a book about me or is this a book about Smith Boy? About the band, yeah. When you're, when you're writing it, you're not quite sure until someone says, you know, it could be about both, you know? Mm. Um, and then that really clicked well for me in my head. And then I, I you know, I was like, yeah, duh, right? I got it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but also, you feel kind of bad, you know, when you're in a band, you're collaborating. Like, um, here I am representing Spitboy, um, and we always collaborated. And now I'm writing about Spitboy, and it's totally not a collaboration. I didn't want to be like selfish or egotistical, which is, yeah. you know, those are all values of like, you know, like, like you know, being egotistical is kind of like anti-punk. Um, you know, is, you know, being, if you're egotist, that's pretty anti-punk rock. And yeah, also absolutely. A thing that women are, it's foisted on women a lot too. Like, don't talk about yourself too much. To that end, when I was looking for pictures for the cover, I had a bunch of photos of Spitboy and I showed them to my husband and um, he was like, I was like, well, this one's not very good because I'm kind of blurry. And this one, you know, I totally can't use because there's a symbol on my face because, you know, I'm the drummer. And this one, I'm in the dark. And, but this one's good. But, you know, and he was like, why are you choosing any of these pictures? None of these are good. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is the Spit Boy rule. It's about the band. And he's like, you wrote the book. You should be on the cover. And again, this is again, it's a similar to what Ramsey said, right? Like, no, duh. Also, there, there are almost no books by rock musicians with the drummer on the cover. You know, drummers don't get that kind of airtime. Hardly ever. Yeah. So I was like, hell yeah. hell yeah, hell okay. yeah. So then, you know, the obvious photo is the one that's on it that Caroline um, Collins took and she was on tour with us. She was our roadie. So she had special access. So she would, you know, get on the stage and watch the, make sure everything was okay with the drums, but she'd often have her camera and she'd be taking these great shots. Mm. And, and, and then um, sort of move, moving into your, um, you know, what you do, what, one thing that you're doing now, which is your role as an educator. Mm-hmm. What, 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 what does that, for, for, for you, what does that give you? Um, well, I'm a people person mm. um, by nature. I think I'm a people. I was a preschool teacher all during Spit Boy, so I'm. Yeah. I'm. You know, I think I was kind of born to be an educator in a lot of ways. Um, but there's something really similar about being in a feminist punk band that talks about issues, and um, being a teacher who's in academia. Um, mm. There's something very similar to that. You know, Spit Boy. I said this before. If um, Spitboy were a class, we'd be a gender studies class, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know, I didn't I didn't go into gender studies. I went into English, but you know, I could certainly teach. I certainly teach some gender study stuff in the English class. Yeah. So there's that connection. 
But honestly, I think for me, the main, the main thing about community college and community college education and being an educator in community college is the young people. Like yeah. punk rock is a young people's uh, subculture. You don't have to be young. You can stay punk your whole life if you want to. Most people just don't because people are just average. You know, <laughs> People grow up and they're like, yeah. they get, you know, brainwashed into thinking that you have to, you know, grow up and be an adult. And yeah. all this not dye your hair crazy colors by yourself <laughs> home when you're bored in the pandemic. Um, but, but um, I truly, really and truly, the thing that, one of the things that punk taught me the most is the power, the intelligence and, and energy of young people mm. and how wonderful that is. Um, the ideas, the, 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 what they, what they bring new to the culture, um, the promise. Um, I just think that, you know, you know, we live in a society that, de that is so ageist and that devalues mm. old people and young people and doesn't, it doesn't think that young people have much to offer. A lot of teachers, themselves don't even like young people they're like oh kids these days you know and I, you know when people get on that trip in a meeting or like in the copy room i leave i'm like yeah. i don't i'm not part i don't participate in that crap i agree you yeah. want to bash teachers you want to bash students i'm not gonna be party to that i'm out of here um so i just find that so ugh, sad yeah uh, so yeah for me it's the young people and um, I don't know, ideas. I love ideas. You know, Spitboy was a message first band. Mm -hmm. And um, I love ideas and I love talking about ideas. And how, how, go ahead. Sorry, I was, I was just going to say, Michelle, how, how do you, how do you, you know, talking about that, how do you keep your kind of, um, your sort of mindset and your kind of creativity alive? Is it, is it the, is it the, um, you know, the people, the young people that you're teaching, do they really kind of feed you? They do. I mean, I think that a lot of teachers believe they have to have a teaching persona. They mm. have to be in charge and they have to know everything and they can't ever let on if they don't know anything. And that's just bullshit. Yeah. None of those things is true. And if you or when, when you realize that you can learn as much from young people about what you're teaching and other things, mm. um, you, you know, you, A, you're going to be a way better teacher. Um, but also you're going to be a better person. Um, so now, you know, now I, because I teach English, um, I teach in a learning community. I teach all the Englishes and I teach creative writing as well. I teach literature right now. I'm teaching American literature um, and dystopian literature. Mm -hmm. Um Dystopian is totally my favorite. <laughs> um, dystopian <laughs> literature is like the most punk literature ever. I love it. Um, so, and I wrote a dystopian novel. I just finished it recently. I'm so okay. revising it a little bit. But um, um, English is a discipline. You know, I teach in a learning community for Latinx students. And um, I've been doing that for years. And I've been teaching in this style where I'm kind of encouraging the students to really write from their own positionalities to write from their standpoint, whether it's in the topics they choose or the details they choose or the use of personal examples in their papers as applicable to the assignment. Mm -hmm. And even um, in terms of the language they use, I'm like, hey, I speak Spanish. You know, if you wanna use a Spanish word in your, in your writing, cause it's better, fucking use it, you know? It. So um, there is, a movement afoot in, in the United States, um, a linguistic justice movement. And um, I am collaborating with a couple of colleagues and we've been writing materials to teach teachers how to encourage students to write in whatever, wow. effectively, in yeah. whatever English they choose to write in. Yeah. And it's a lot, it's, it, it involves a lot, you know, there's, there's many pieces to it. And this is, this is the work. This is for me, I believe 
I believe that this is my going to be the culmination of of my life's work mm. um, in education. Like I I believe that that what we're doing is it's really scary because when I first started, I just would do it in my own classroom. And then I had a colleague and I, she and I talked and we both were doing some similar things. I said, we need to write some materials. We need to write this shit down, you know, rather than just, you know, and share it with everybody. Mm. Um, it's a way to bring cultural wealth, to, to help students to draw on their cultural wealth, to help them care more about school and to make school a more welcoming place, to make school less, um uh you know adversarial mm. because a lot of people of a lot of students of color come to schools and it's a white space and it's an yeah. adversarial space yeah. and it's a space that doesn't respect their language doesn't respect their culture doesn't respect um the way they view the world or the way they speak and um i i just think that i think that after in particular the summer of racial reckoning that we had i think that this is the moment to really mm. and I, so I spent all summer writing as many materials as i could kind of in the same way i did with the book i just sat down and made a list and i started writing lesson lesson after mm. lesson and my colleague and i we meet every friday and we talk about the lessons we wrote we wrote a module we've been giving talks to other community college teachers and sharing our um Imagine. our teaching lessons um, and it's catching on, so I'm very excited. We call it next level English. By the that's, way. In, that's incredible. I mean, that that really that really is incredible. I, do you, do you feel like you're you're sort of pushing against a door that is now sort of slightly open, that's more open than it was, and it, and there's a more receptive mindset. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's so nice. there's um, in 1974, um, a statement came out by this um, educational institution called the Four C's, and it was um students rights to their own language and in yeah. it this is 1974 wow. in yeah. it it says that students should be able to write in whatever english they want and um and then it kind of you know it's a short statement and then it has this longer pieces that explains how that might be done well a lot of people believe that but there's no there's a lot of theory but there's no practice and that's what i realized there's almost no praxis lesson mm. or materials mm. and um I knew that what I was doing in the classroom already could be that if I wrote it down. Um, and so over the summer um, in the United States, the same organization came out, um, the black educators um, related to that, who are part of that, that institution or that organization, the four C's came out with a statement called, this ain't another statement, it's a demand. And it's about specifically black linguistic justice. And, um, you know that came out at the perfect time because I'm over here writing my material. So the more the more other you know documents, scholarly um, or otherwise that are related, kind of um, help build on my work or help my legitimize my work. But it is scary. I mean, in terms of like um, you know your podcast and and the theme that you're going out in terms of like striking out and doing something you know um, failing like. I've had moments where I felt like, I don't know if people are going to buy this. Like, I felt like I had to, I was writing the lessons and I was going and searching for the research to support what I was writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew it was there. I knew it existed because I read stuff like that when I was in graduate school, but I wanted to find some more up-to-date information as well. Um, so yeah, next level English. It's, it's like my new thing. And I, um, I am, we are writing a textbook. I mean, it's, it, I, I, sounds lame, but <laughs> I think I, I mean I think I think that's that I mean that's that's really incredible. I mean, you've got a real you know you know kind of opportunity to you know to sort of make some change. It, you, you one of the things you know I've noticed is like as as people gen, generally speaking, a large part of the population as they get older, their um, desire to take risks reduces you know, so I'm, 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 I can't I can't take risks you know I'm, I'm comfortable you know you kind of get into this this kind of sludgy kind of mid-tier I'm not going to do anything you know upset the apple cart you know what what you're doing is 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 something that is yes you, you you've got an opportunity to to kind of change the the you know it's I'm sure it's not going to be easy all the way to do that but in terms of what you're doing, that's that's a um, you know a kind of great thing to to sort of take on and and um, and tackle. 
it is the I think it is the bravest thing I'm doing right now for mm. sure the most revolutionary potentially revolutionary thing I'm doing um how, do, how does it make you feel well you know over the summer in the pandemic everyone was bright you know there, a lot of people were like were um protesting and rioting and I just didn't feel safe going mm. to the demonstrations and I really wanted to yeah. but I just didn't feel safe and um <clears throat> You know, and I'm the only person working in my family right now, so I mm. cannot risk my health. You know, I support yeah. three other people. Yeah. So um, I needed something that some place to put that anger and that frustration. Like I needed, I felt like I need to do something for the world, which sounded really grandiose, right? And then I was like, maybe I can't do something for the world, but I can do something for my students. So originally yeah. I was writing the lessons and just putting them on the website for my other faculty members to use on our campus. And then I was like, wait a minute, I could also start telling some of my friends who are colleagues in other colleges about it. And maybe we can, uh, people can adopt mm -hmm. it more widely. And then I shared it with someone from the Four C's organization. And he was like, uh, don't be putting all your materials on the website for free because publishers are looking for this stuff right now and those shady publishers will steal your shit we'll so take it. it down and so i'm putting it behind a paywall now on our, yeah. our learning management system mm. that, that feels safer um, but i do want people to start using it right now like i don't want to wait till the book because students need it now need they need it now uh, they needed it 25 years ago you mm. know so um that feels it feels really I feel the way I feel to answer your question, I feel like I, I'm doing something. I feel mm. like um, I have a place. It, it feels like advocacy for me. It feels like activism. Now, mm. I, it is very important for me to say this one thing. And that is that while it feels like activism um, and while it is extra, it is extra work beyond my regular teaching load and my committee work. Yeah. Um, but I have tenure and i can't be fired at my job unless i do something really heinous like you know fuck an underage student or like mm. you know kill somebody mm. um and i have health insurance i have vision i have dental i have job security mm. and those and the things that i'm that that it allows me to do like i and being paid by the taxpayers of the state of California to do yeah. my job. So while I may not have grown up with a lot of privilege, while um, you know, I may have been, you know, underestimated as a young person, yeah. I now have tenure and I in job security and a job in that gives me a good deal of privilege. And that's not something I take lightly. Like, yeah, yeah. it's not something I take lightly. Um, I am going to, for me, it's important. And in some ways, this also means I'm a little hard on myself, but, <laughs> um, but it is really important for me to, to do good by that, to do good yeah. by the taxpayers, the people who don't get to sit in a nice warm office and read books for a living. Yeah, yeah. Pay my salary and for the students who come to my classes. I mean that's a that's a really good point, and 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 you, you know especially you know where, where you you paid by the taxpayer, you know the scrutiny you know quite rightly is that you you know you you do the you do the right thing. So to you know to to have the activism almost as a um, a related but separate mm -hmm. distinct part of what you do. It's related. You're basically kind of using what what you do, and what you're good at the skills that you have to 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 for, for that that kind of to, to bring about that sort of social change and doing it in that um like you said you know where do, where do you start you know and you're starting well i can change i can start to 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 make some change for my students and start at that that kind of micro level and then kind of hopefully then grow it which i, I think is you know the, the you know the institutional systems level change is so big so big I mean, it's, you know, but here, 
so here's crazy, this crazy thing. So Glendale Community College, which is one of our collaborating colleges, they're adopting our materials. Um, after I gave a second talk with my colleague, Keisha Casella Turner, um, we, so Glendale, they just, they were, they had already said they were going to adopt the materials as an English department. Mm. So some other people from other departments attended the second meeting that we came to. Then they went to a campus um, planning meeting, institutional planning, institutional effectiveness planning committee. Well, every campus has to have one of these kind of committees. Our campus has one too. And you write these, um, you write institutional goals. Um, um, and then you, and then you measure those goals. That's what, that's the job of the committee, right? They added, <laughs> this is so crazy, adopt next level English, <laughs> which is barely a thing yet as a campus goal. Wow. As a campus wide goal. That's My incredible. campus hasn't even that's, done that yet. Wow. <laughs> So we were just like, Keisha and I almost, I almost fell off the chair when I read the email. I got an email from, <laughs> from the English department chair and she's just like, yeah, guess what happened? And I was like, wait, what? Um, so people are hungry. People are hungry for yeah. this. And, and the reason why they're hungry, like I said earlier, is there's a lot of theory and there's not a lot of practice. Um. practice. Um, and normally a teacher can say, a teacher can learn about an idea and then um, bring it into their classroom like oh yeah that makes sense because we learned pedagogy and we know how to teach especially yeah. community I'm talking about community college educators because our our job is to teach not to publish or yeah. to you know to to do a bunch of research mm. we are practitioners of teaching we are the experts of teaching so um, a lot of teachers will learn a new concept and be able to integrate it into their classroom pretty easily on their own. Mm. But this is something, that idea that students should be able to write in whatever English they want, um, because we have to deal with standards, grading standards, and have a common language and rubrics, it's a lot harder to do that. And so um, we're, we're, we're trying to like flesh all of that out. Mm. For, for people and say like you know we're in, we're this is how we're doing it um and then once teachers have a model of something that's really revolutionary then they can usually integrate but this is a thing that they need a model on so Keisha and I were like god damn it let's just sit down and write this stuff you know, <laughs> do it. um why not so and you know the pandemic I don't have any place to go or you know I'm not traveling I'm really taking it very seriously yeah so my son, the other day, he said, you know, gosh, you know, what do we have to show for this year? I said, I don't know what you got to show, but I got something to show for it. <laughs> yeah, it can give you a few <laughs> things right here. I said, I got, a, I got two books that I think that I won, you know, one new concept for a book and a bunch of materials for it and a, and a whole novel revised. So I don't know, speak for yourself, mister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. If, if you were to, to um, this, this is a bit, a bit of a, it's kind of broad question you know anybody anybody that's wanting to you know kind of make some change in their make some big kind of change in their in their life and he's you know sort of experiencing you know these these kind of mental hurdles you know for doing that what, what is, is there a piece of advice you could you could give them gosh i don't know i mean so experiencing like a mental hurdle and they wanted to make a change. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, if you, if, um, I don't know, you're like, you, 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 you just have the fear. You just think, oh, I can't do it. You know, I, I can't, I can't, do, I could, I'm interested in this, but I couldn't possibly do that. I'm, I'm not, right. either not good enough or whatever. Yeah, there's, I was reading about this theory that I makes that makes sense. And I think it's something that I've done. And that is that you, if you want to start a new habit or you want to do something and it seems hard and you're afraid of it, um, you should just do it a little bit because once you start doing it, mm -hmm. um, because you really want to do it, it'll feel good. You know, it'll start probably feeling good and then you're more mm -hmm. likely to continue doing it. So you just kind of have to, you kind of have to like do it. I mean, on the other hand, like I was afraid to tell my English department that I was teaching this way, not because I thought they would, I thought 
they would think it was fine. They trust me. They trust me as an educator completely. But mm. I just sort of thought it was, um, I thought it was sort of a, that they would just think it was niche for students of color, even though mm. I knew that it would be applicable to everybody. And when Keisha joined our English department, when she was hired full time, and, and then we started talking, um, we realized that we were doing similar things and that we should make it make it an actual thing mm. and write the lessons and share them with other people. Um, for me, that was a moment that was sort of like a spit boy moment for me. Like, yeah, I this thing is hard. I want to do this thing. And um, I get over the hurdle by collaborating. Like for me, I think for me, like that is one of the things I learned from Spookboy. Like you can really, um, when, when, you're, when you have like a fear of doing something by yourself, it's probably because you know, A, it's scary and you're fear, your fear of failure, but there might be some pieces that you don't, that you're not as good at. Yeah. Right? That you're, that you're thinking are going to like get in the way. Right. So if you can find people who want to do something similar, who have other kinds of strengths, then all of a sudden you're sharing the work, you know, you're sharing yeah. the work or, you know, just talk, talk about the ideas with somebody. For yeah. me, that's one of my favorite things. It's like, you know, like being in a writing group is fun, but sometimes it's enough just to like talk about what you're writing with someone. Yeah. Uh, so talking about the ideas and, you know, it's like therapy, right? It's like, oh, what, what, am, what am I suggesting? I think I'm just suggesting talk therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's the answer and I don't, I don't even go to therapy it's funny but um and maybe like maybe I feel like I don't need therapy because I know how to collaborate with people mm. and collaboration is really powerful I think it's really really powerful um and it can bring a lot to your life and it can really help you um because people can sh people can show you what your strengths are yeah. and then also then you can draw on other people's strengths um, and people can confirm your strengths for you or confirm, yes, that's a good idea. Um, and that goes a long way. It really does. So Do you know, yes. We, we haven't even had time to talk about collaboration. I agree with you. I think it's, I think it's massively important. We'll have to save that for another time because I think it's like super interesting. And, and yeah. uh, I, I mean, I, I, um, I'm sort of part of, part of an arts lab and the, there's a kind of group of very diverse people with uh, that, that, that each bring different um approaches different skills to you know to the you know to the mix and just kind of talking about things you, you're absolutely right i mean it, it it's it's so powerful and, and it you know i think that you know that that kind of community where it's it, it's um uh what's the what's the word where they you know basically the you know the, the group supports each other you know, so any yeah. kind of like misgivings that you might have over your own ability to do something is is you know goes you know because there's there's this sort of supportive group around you that's that's encouraging you, or taking the slack you know when you maybe you think okay I really can't do this you know and and it's it it kind of builds the power from it for it, it itself like that I think it's uh, it's hugely the dystopian novel that I just finished. Um you know, most dystopian novels don't end happy. Yeah. And I kind of thought I had to end sad. And I, that was fine with me, you know, and it makes sense it, to a certain extent. Um, but I figured it would probably not have like a really um, tied up, I mean, it's, lit it's supposed to be literary, so it shouldn't be too tied up, right? Mm. Literary ending. Um, but I, I, I figured, you know, it would be more on the, the, sad or kind of like not knowing like the you would leave the reader wondering exactly what happened mm. and the book ended up ending kind of happy it has like a happy ending and the core of the happiness of the book is that the protagonist has her community mm. this found community around her mm -hmm. and the end of the book that is really what the book is about the book is yeah. about finding your people and your community who can help you 
develop your strengths and support you and be there for you. And, and, you know, I mean, this is, it can't, this can't be said enough. Everything in life comes down to relationships. It's all about relationships. Relationships matter. And when the class broke up and Joe Strummer finally realized what he had done by kicking Mick Jones out of the band, he said it in a number of interviews. He does. Don't, don't fuck with that. You don't fuck with chemistry. And and you know they had this good thing in these relationships and they picked at it and they picked at it and they allowed it to fester um when they had a good thing and they and 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 they knew it but they couldn't resist that human the human folly of of picking it apart um nurturing those communities and those relationships whether it's classroom or art that's you know that's really you know the most human thing that we can do. Absolutely, I completely. Agree. Now we need it more than ever. <laughs> we do. You're absolutely right, Michelle. I could, I, I, I could honestly, I could, I could talk for hours. It's, it's oh, been God. so fascinating. Honestly, yeah, thank you. you. Thank fun. you so much. It's been, uh, that's been a lot of fun. Um, thanks so much. Thanks so much for your time. Um, I, I'm sure that people will find this really, really helpful. You know, to them um you know in their in their own lives and um and again thanks so much for for taking the time out well thank you so much for inviting me i really appreciate it not at all thanks michelle take care thanks for listening to the show and i really hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll tune in for the next episode in the meantime it would be really awesome if you could rate and review the show and also share it with any friends who you think might enjoy it 